Hi friends, today I am sharing a conversation with the fabulous Leslie Ann Bird, all about setting up routines for the music room. We'll talk about how we know it's time to think or rethink our routines, and we'll also discuss some common pain points that a lot of us feel. Things like getting students into the classroom and doing classroom activities like passing out instruments, and then closing out the lesson in a way that feels cohesive and not chaotic when it's time to line up. I'll link Leslie Ann's bio in the show notes so that you can read more about her background and also find some ways to connect with her. And with that, let's jump in. My name is Victoria Bowler, and this is episode 69 of Elemental Conversations. All right, Leslie Ann, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for inviting me, Victoria. I appreciate it. I know you and all of your work on teaching with ORF, and I've watched your um, presentation at AOSA, which was absolutely fabulous. But then I was digging around on teaching with ORF, and I found your webinar on, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, the efficient classroom or something something along. The, the efficient music educator, I think it was. <laughs> yes. And I was like, efficient music educator? That is absolutely what I want to be. So I bought it. <laughs> I watched it. It was incredible. Um, so today you get to help us establish some routines and procedures and set up things like that for our classrooms. So Leslie Ann, can you describe how would we know if we would benefit from more routines or if we would benefit from kind of buckling up routines that we have already that maybe have gone to the wayside how would we how would we know that this is something that we need to do even if it's not something you need to do i think it's beneficial to do um and you'll definitely know that you need to if you're having um classroom management issues at a specific part or time of your lesson, mm -hmm. or when you're trying to get students to uh, get instruments or line up or come into the room. If those are problem points for you where you find yourself always going, why, why? There's that That's a place for a procedure. Mm -hmm. And if you're not having those issues, it's still great because um, once your kids get into those established routines and procedures, mm -hmm. um, th they flow eventually without prompting. And um, I found when I need to, uh, there's an emergency and I need to speak with a teacher as my students are coming in. After those routines and procedures are established, the kids know what to do. They go right in, they sit down, they get right to work on what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a question about supplies, they know who's getting them and where they're coming from and all of that. Um, and it helps my substitutes too. Um, there's been a few times where I've been in the building for like a PD or something, but had a substitute. And when I've come back to the classroom to get something, they're just doing their routines without even thinking because it's so well ingrained. Yeah. So we will, we will know that we could kind of use a few more routines if we feel um, any sort of chaos specifically around classroom management. And if we don't feel that chaos around classroom management, that's probably a sign that we have really good routines. Probably, yes. let me know, let me know if you disagree with this, Leslie Ann, but probably um, if, if there is a low chaos classroom, it's probably not because we just got lucky and got the quote unquote good students or the like quote unquote gifted and talented students, right? Would you, would you agree with <laughs> that? Gift, the gifted and talented <laughs> students tend to be the most chaotic, I find. My hardest classes to ever teach was when I was in a school that was K through eight with a gifted program. <laughs> Those gifted seventh graders will push every button you have. <laughs> well, and so maybe maybe you want to talk about that for for a second, thinking about yeah. um, like kind of the if we think about like zone of proximal development, or we think about appropriate mm -hmm. challenge and appropriate support for some of these, we can call them exceptional children, whatever the the lingo yeah. is at your school. Maybe you can talk about routines and specific populations of students, um, and just how important it is uh, for for all students for sure, but especially yeah. you might see it kind of pop up in in some of our specific classes. Yeah, so again, I, I agree with you that it benefits all students. I find, uh, I think a lot in the universal design for learning 
um, framework. Um, and an example, if you're not familiar, is ramps um, in a building for um, people with disabilities. Well, people with disabilities use the ramp for a wheelchair or equipment, but I use the ramp when I'm bringing a lot of materials and I have my rolly cart. Mm -hmm. And um, we might use the ramp if we bring, if we ride our bicycle to school instead of hauling it up the stairs yep. and those push button doors. So even though it's designed to benefit one group of people, it benefits all of the people <laughs> and we can all use the ramp pretty much where only some people can use the stairs. So let's make it a ramp. Um, that's kind of how I approach my procedures in the classroom. So there might be a different need in each group of students for the procedures, mm -hmm. and it might scratch a different itch for each um, population of students or I don't know about you, but I find class to class, like it's just some combinations of kids um, tend to be more clashy and, you know, a lot of strong personalities in one class and some classes just seem to get along super easy and there's never a problem lining up because yeah. they just are all good. Mm -hmm. um, but even so, having that procedure in place for them lets them know uh, that this is what's expected, even when I'm not here. Um, and it gives all of the kids kind of a sense of security in knowing what's coming next and mm -hmm. how to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. Because through these procedures, I find that I can meet the human needs of my students a lot better mm -hmm. because I don't have to have them ask me for everything all the time because they know the procedure at the tissue box is one student may be at the tissue box. You don't have to ask me if you need to go to get a tissue because I trust you as a human mm -hmm. to know when you need to blow your nose. Mm -hmm. But we may not have two people at the tissue box at a time unless there's an emergency. Um, and, and when they get that, mm -hmm then I don't have to worry about, can I go get a tissue? They just do it. Yeah. And it's not interrupting the lesson. And that's a basic human need that they shouldn't need to ask for unless it's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and if it becomes a problem, then we have to go take a step back and talk about that and then go back to the system we have in place for asking which in my case is to do this so that I don't have to stop talking or teaching. I can just go mm. and they know they can go. Mm -hmm. But as long as I can trust the class to uh, do that, it's the same with me for the bathroom. I have the, I don't I found saw it on either Facebook or TikTok, the bathroom light. I mean, I always let them go, but the bathroom light is even easier because they don't have to look for the pass. Um, if the light's on, someone's out. If the light's off, someone's not. And as mm -hmm. long as it's, handled appropriately, go to the bathroom whenever you need to. Uh, last year, I had one fifth grade class that couldn't handle the bathroom button. Like mm. every time one person came back, there was this like race to the bathroom button of yeah. five people who could be there first. And I was like, oh, darn, sorry. We have to go back to the kindergarten thing where you where you give me the bathroom sign and <laughs> we see, see if you can go, you know, until we can reestablish that procedure in an appropriate way. Mm. So those procedures can help us to meet their human needs in a way that feels less prison yeah. <laughs> and more human yes. and also help them to build um, responsibility for their own actions. Because if you can't handle that, uh, that leeway, then uh, we have to take a step back and practice again for a little while and, and then we'll try it again in a month or two and yeah. see if we can if we can go through that. And if you do that a couple of times, they students really enjoy autonomy. Um, yeah. And when autonomy has to be rolled back, it's a motivator to get back to 
that autonomy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you've given us so many crystal clear examples <laughs> of how routines do not dehumanize the classroom. It's not that everyone is, um, you know, Ms. Bird's robot, right? The routines are no. there to give students agency. And when we have appropriate routines, it takes the responsibility for everyone's good behavior, quote unquote, good behavior. It takes it off of us and it puts it onto the students. Now, something you said, Leslie Ann, is super important. And I do want to talk about very concrete routines. But before we jump in there, I know that um, for me, and I think I, like my hand is up on this, and I think a lot of other people's hands are up on this. Sometimes we we hear this phrase or we use this phrase um, like it's March. We've had this routine since September. We shouldn't still be having to do the routine. And what you've described is like a flexible scaffolding of routines where um, in the same way, like if kids are not playing a barred instrument piece accurately, it's not, well, the barred instruments aren't used anymore. It's like there's a there's a scaffold that we used to get there. And so we're going to go back to the previous scaffold. Right. And you talked about that some with with the bathroom um, idea and, yeah. and what you said about fifth grade is like, yep, that sounds <laughs> that sounds absolutely correct. And, and right? at this point, I'm teaching in an all boys school. So <laughs> Lots of it was like a full on like race to the ball. And people were like flying into the cabinets and I was like, oh, oh, no, we need to go back <laughs> and take a break and try again later. And, mm -hmm. and let's take the step backwards. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and what you were saying is uh, think about your principal and the routines or your administration and the routines that are set for teachers. Mm. The same thing happens with adults is you set the routines and the expectations at the beginning of the year and yeah. everyone follows them. And then about the time March rolls around and everyone's exhausted, they say, oh, I'm just gonna let the kids walk down to the end of the hallway to music by themselves and I'm not gonna walk down them because I'm tired. Yeah. And then your principal has to say, nope, nope, we don't let students walk down the hallway unsupervised because that's where problems happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the um, uh, dental parenting folks I listened to on uh, TikTok mentioned, why do we hold children to higher standards than adults? Woo! And I was like, you're right. We do all the time. We expect them to know all the rules and procedures and to follow them all the time. Do you follow every rule and procedure when you drive? That's the example he gives all the time. Do you sometimes roll through that stop sign or not come to a complete stop or drive five or 10 miles over the speed limit? Do you know better? Yes. Do you always do it? No. So, and we're grown and they're five in some instances or 12, yeah. which is even worse. <laughs> so true. <laughs> because their brains are just changing so often. So students need that reinforcement and that reteaching over and over again. Mm. I build those in after breaks or, um, you know, that's always priority for me, like after a break is to schedule a lesson that uses certain routines and mm. then review those routines um, right when we get back. Um, who yeah. can tell me how we stack the chairs so we can do movement? Who can tell me, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. I also um, build in review for fire drill, tornado drill, and those kind of drills because Yes, they practice them every month or whatever, but almost never in your room. Yeah. And um, I pre-record those <laughs> at the beginning of the year and make them silly with my selfie stick. I walk out to where we stand and turn around and explain the whole thing. So then every time I have a sub, one of those gets played um, to review and then they go on to whatever the lesson is for the sub. And then I review those again at uh, semester mm. as a warm up for a class. That's huge right there. I know you mentioned that in your webinar as well, that you have pre-recorded videos so that you are not saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over, right? And also, for whatever reason, um, people are more likely to kind of perk up and pay attention to Leslie Ann on the screen than they are at another teacher just like wah, 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 wah all the time, right? So I think that's that's super, super uh, valuable for, for people to think about, not necessarily with just fire drills, but anything else like recorder, left hand on top or or something something along those lines. Yes, yes. Just Great. Stick it up there, put it in your Google Classroom. 
<laughs> so they can have it as a reference if you have access to tech. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so you mentioned way up at the top of the conversation that we will know that we could use some more routines or a tightening up or a review or a refresh or whatever, you know, your, your choice word of our procedures and routines if there is a time in our classroom flow where we're noticing a lot of friction. One of the main points of friction, uh, Leslie, and in my opinion, happens before kids even get into their spots to start the music class. So can you help us with just some routines to get the class actually started, get kids from the hallway and into some sort of mental space where they're ready to, to music? Yes. So this is what works for all of these procedures. Caveat, this is what works for me for my teaching situation and for the students that I serve. Your students are not my students. So they, the procedures and your room is not set up like my room and your equipment is not like my equipment yeah, necessarily. We'll too, yeah. So all of these need to be personalized um, for what works for you and your students and your teaching style and your level of tolerance for things, because that's different for different people. Mm -hmm. um, so how I structured mine is fourth, fifth and fourth and fifth. And I, there was a time where it was fourth, fifth, sixth, and then sixth moved to middle school. So it goes back and forth. Um, yeah. And also I have done K eight as well, where I had fifth year, eighth graders. Yeah. And um, when they come in the, I, I made sure each child had a folder and uh, some with some paper in it and um, an assigned seat. Now I know that some people are like, I don't want to assign seats. It like makes my life so much easier. First of all, I don't know how anyone doesn't do assigned seats and keep track of who needs the EpiPen? Who's deathly allergic to peanuts? Who, I, I had four kids with seizure disorders that I had to have the seizure bucket and the thing and the timer. And who needs to sit up front for their uh, IEP? Who needs to sit away from distractions? Yep. Um, all of that stuff. I don't know, I can't keep track of all that for my 400, 500, 600, sometimes a thousand students. Um, so and it like solidifies in my brain who is who yes. um, and it helps me to keep track of their names a lot better so i always have an assigned spot or an assigned seat mm. for that reason and um i keep the folders in my room so i don't have to worry about i forgot my folder and i have pencils in my room um so there's the uh but there, it's, it builds their responsibility to bring a pencil. And then you're going to be arguing with children about having a pencil. So I have, I order pencils. And when I didn't have money to order pencils, I would wait for those Staples other days and have everyone I know go to Staples and buy me a pack of pencils. <laughs> and then I have a student job helper who comes at the end of the day. It's usually a student who walks home or you know gets picked up late all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, their job is to sharpen 60 pencils at the beginning of the day. I have two cans, one with the, one with the corny sharp sign and one with the corny flat sign. Yep. And um, I make them, you know, we talk about putting them eraser side down so that we can see if it's sharp or flat. And if you break a pencil, you put it in the flat. And if you need a pencil, you get it out of the sharp. So I stand at my door for my fourth grade up and I hand every student a pencil as they walk in. There are students who prefer their own super sharp, special, fancy mechanical pencil. Great, bring your own if you want. And then yeah. they just say, no, thank you. Um, and everyone has a pencil. They walk to their seat and there is something for them to do on the board or some kind of short little handout. Mm. like. If we're working on reading treble clef notes, it's like um, five examples of make these words. Like it's nothing mm -hmm. hardcore. Yep. And then we just go over that quickly at the beginning of the lesson. And uh, I don't know where I heard this, but this is not my idea. It had to be in a book that I read. I got one of those library stamps with the date on it. <laughs> and as long as they're trying their best, 
and they're working on it, they get a date stamp on it and they think the date stamp is some kind of voodoo magic because oh, I'm yeah. change the date every day. Do you have one for every day? I'm like, no, you just don't understand how a library used to work before computers. <laughs> and, uh, and they get five points for every stamp doesn't have to be correct. It just has to be their best effort. Mm. The only way they don't get a stamp is if they simply don't do it or they say it's too hard and don't even try. So those are the only ways you don't get your stamp. You can screw up the whole paper and you still get your five points. Mm -hmm. So they have a motivation to keep trying. And um, a lot of them will then try and find out they do know how to do it. So it's a confidence builder. Um, then we, the kids who don't get it, we go over it really quick. So they get a reinforcement of that idea and it's not just busy work. And then we move on to the lesson. Sometimes it's things tied to a lesson. So if we're learning about rounds in fourth grade, different kinds of harmony, rounds and descants, mm -hmm. um, explain the difference between a round and a descant. You know, mm -hmm. what did we talk about? Those kind of things. Um, or if we're doing something creative, it might be brainstorm six words that go with trees, you know, because we're going to use those in the ORF lesson later on. So it's it's not busy work. It's, it's tied to the lesson. Then they put their stuff in the folder. They put that folder away um, and then we move on. And there's systems for that as well. If we're not going to use the folders for the rest of the class, um, I have the my, I start my students in chairs in rows. Um, little people start on the floor in rows. Mm. Um, and then they have a number, one, two, three, four, five, and they have a color. So it's red team, blue team, and I use electrical tape um, or hockey tape. It's called at, at, Tar at uh, Home Depot. It comes in 900 different colors for um, hockey and tent hockey sticks and tennis rackets. Yeah, yeah. And I just have a number and a piece of tape. And my custodians were awesome. And they used to let me um, put it down before they waxed. So nice. it lasted about half the year. And then at, after that, I'd have to do it for third marking period and fourth marking period, I usually had to replace. But it would last for a good half a year that way. Mm -hmm. And then um, they know that uh, one passes their folder to two, two to three, three to there four. Is. Four to five, five puts folders away. When we pass papers in, if, if I'm collecting something that they've been working on, five to four, four to three, three to two, two to one, row three to row two, row two to row one, and then they give it to me. So we practice those things. Um, books is number four. <laughs> so um, the person who sits in number five seat right next to the door is our door person, the person who sits next to them is our backup door person. Mm. So uh, because we, you know, uh, we keep our door shut and locked for security reasons. Um, so and then if someone knocks on the door, we know our door person's getting the door, there isn't like 16 kids running to the door. And we know if that person's absent, it's the next person. But what if the next person, it, then it's the next person. <laughs> And the person who sits nearest the light switch is our light manager. And the person who sits next to them is the backup light manager. So we practice like all of those things, like first marking period. Every lesson involves passing something mm -hmm. to the center and passing it up. It could be anything. Yeah. And then it involves passing our folders out to five and then passing them back in. And then the, they just put it in a crate and I have it for the next time they come to class. Um, and I keep them in the closet and I only have the baskets out that I need for the day yeah. on, on my little shelf. So you don't have a wall of folders in your room. Um, but it, it takes a minute in September, but then the next year when they're in fifth grade, I'm only really reteaching and the new kids and the rest of them are like, yeah, this is how this goes. And then it, that system then also flows into other systems because now we stack our chairs so we know that four i got stools eventually which is even easier yeah. but chair four stacks onto chair five chair three stacks onto that and then chair two and chair one always goes on top and the five person pushes the chairs off to the side now we have an open floor for folk dancing for movement for instruments creative practice and i can get them down to less than a minute mm. to stack up their chairs. Now we have our tape and we're standing on our tape and our number 
-hmm. And I have three rows because I have 30. Sometimes I had a um, rainbow team in the back <laughs> and <laughs> because I had 36 one year in third grade. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but rainbow team adds another a dimension, but we made it work. Um, but when I have 30 or fewer, now I can make a circle really easily. Um, back row stays exactly where they are and takes one step backwards. First row turns around. It was usually orange and green in the middle. Green goes to this side to make the yep. side of the square. Orange goes to that side to make the side of the square. Now we're in a circle. Everyone knows where they go. No one's fighting about standing next to their friend. Yep. Yep. <laughs> because it's the it's the procedure. As we go throughout the game or whatever we're doing, the lineup might change and that's fine. But um, it solves a lot of problems that way. So yeah. having that system, they know what they're doing when they come into the room immediately. Little people come into the room and sit on their, uh, I, I greet them at the door, we sit on our spot and we immediately go into a hello song with their name. And, they, and I start going down the rows to help me remember their names. And yep. then, then I start mixing it up so they never know when their name's coming. Kids love to hear their name, their name song. My college students, when I'm teaching them the name songs, like when I sing their name, this huge smile comes on their face. So they get really excited about hearing their name in a song. So can you that, sing, can you give us an example of uh, one of your name songs? Yeah, so um, I usually make them up. <laughs> So one of my favorites that I made up was Hello little children come sing with me today Hello little children come sing and dance and play Hello Victoria come sing with me today Hello George come sing and dance and play So you can get two kids in each in each one in you know, if you have 25, 30 kids, it goes relatively fast. Mm -hmm. um, if you have more than that, you could modify that tune so that you could get four kids in in each round. Um, so that's that's my favorite one that I, I use the most. But That's so different. charming. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah, and everyone likes to hear their names. Um, and... Oh gosh. And if you're taking the approach of like, it's a very orphy thing to do of like, I need a song for X. Well, write a song for X, right? Like that's a very orph inspired thing to do. So if you have 30 kids and you're going to say hello to Jacqueline and Everett and son of a da -da 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 -da. hello to so and so and so and so and so, yeah. and so like you can, you can pack in as many as you want. Just pick your meter and, and run yeah. with it. Right. But that's, that's beautiful. Leslie. And I love that idea. Yeah. So, the, I mean, you know, we walk in the door, I'm saying hello to them. They go directly to the spot. We immediately sing that hello song um, and they get into that routine of mm. waiting for their name and getting really excited. And which yeah. hello song is it going to be? Um, mm. That song got written because I had a hello song. It was a new one that I got from someone and I got into class and completely blanked. I could not I remember know. it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I, this was a time when I was in, I was doing the primary was in one building and the intermediate was in the other. And I had left the song at the intermediate. <laughs> it was like, I guess I'm making something up today. <laughs> and that's what came out. And I've been using it ever since. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So you've helped us get kids into the classroom and we have some morning work or we have a morning greeting and, or we have a morning greeting for everyone. And I know we could spend a longer time on like the beginning of class but just for the sake of this conversation let's let's zoom through and talk to me about another uh thing that you mentioned which is when we pass out our folders or we pass in papers or we stack our chairs you mentioned that that kind of bleeds over these procedures kind of bleed over into other things right i would yeah. imagine that your um, procedures for instruments would also be uh, um, helped out by, by all of the procedures that you've already talked about. So talk to us about, 
um, passing out. So I, I'm going to say, let's, let's imagine Leslie Ann that I'm going to do something with rhythm sticks. Okay. So I go, everyone sit down, sit down, crisscross, and I'm going to give you your rhythm sticks. And if you play before I say, I'm going to take your instrument away. Oh, everyone's playing before I say, I have to take everyone's <laughs> instrument away. So now, and now I'm mad at my kids, Leslie Ann. So now what should, what should yeah. I do? With um, so I have a pretty high tolerance for levels of chaos. Okay. <laughs> um, and when I go to ORF workshops, I am always in trouble for playing the instrument while the presenter is talking. You're the noodler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm like touching things and I'm playing them like, oh, this tambourine's really cool. Um, so again, I don't hold the children to a higher standard than I hold adults <laughs> in an ORF workshop. Um, I don't care if they play the rhythm sticks while I'm passing them out. Who cares? Let them play them. But they have to have a sign to stop. So this is something uh, uh, specifically with little people that we, we make it a game at the beginning. Um, I'll hand them um, an instrument. Um, I usually do a wide variety of them. And the Greg and Steve freeze dance is great for this. Um, so they just, we freeze dance and then we sit down and they play their instrument and then they have to freeze and put their hands on their head like this. And the instrument has to be on the floor. Um, and then um, we do it in a rotating circle. So they have to pass their instrument and they get to play a different one every time. I think that's the coolest thing. Yeah. And then we just play these, then we just play this random game at the end where I, I, and I make this hilarious. I get really big and I bend down and I go, okay, when I do this, you play. And then when I do this, you stop. Right. So we just do that over and over and over again as a game. And I, I say, oh, I got you. I caught you. I'm tricky music teacher. Uh -huh. You didn't uh -huh. stop. Uh -huh. I don't punish them when they don't do it. It's a game. It's silly. Um, and then when I get to passing out the rhythm sticks for a lesson, I let them play. <laughs> it's, it's just so much easier than arguing with them with a five year old who's got an instrument in their hand and wants to play it more than life itself to not let them so bonk away on your rhythm sticks as long as you are only hitting your own rhythm sticks you're hitting them gently enough that you're not breaking them mm -hmm. and you're not touching anyone else with your rhythm sticks mm -hmm. great yeah Bananas. and there's a big there's a big difference between like sound exploration and kind of getting the itch out there's a big difference between that and pure chaos in the classroom yes. right and you've talked to us about how to kind of mitigate that you're not advocating for like i just dump the rhythm sticks out and <laughs> kids can do whatever they want right because it's like there no. we want to humanize the classroom and kids are kid like kids be creative right like you and i are, are very pro humanize the classroom like kids explore, <laughs> yes. blah, 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 blah. but you've given us some parameters that it's not just yes. anything goes so at the you know and and we always have the, at the beginning the the discussion and the practice about the instruments um, you know, that we treat them carefully. And again, it's all done with humor. So I might make a video about that. Um, there are some hilarious ORF instrument videos um, on YouTube. I know Bowtie Music has one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is what you do and this is what you don't do, but it's hilarious. You know, it's got the <clears throat> kind of big X in the middle and the kids he got to act in it are hilarious. Um, so those go a long way. And even with my little kids, um, you know, I, I take the shaky egg and I start throwing it in the air and I'm like, should I be doing this? Like, no, you shouldn't. So I'll model those things ahead of time. Um, and, th and that's constant. So when I have that extra five minutes, maybe that's something I review. Should I be playing the rhythm sticks like this? And I pretend to bonk a kid in the head, but I don't really know. Right. Like, that's silly, Mrs. Bird. Um, so addressing those procedures with humor also goes a lot, a long way too with, with little kids. And then, so while I'm passing out the rhythm sticks, again, I have my five, four, three, two, one situation. I will give my number ones all of the rhythm sticks and they take two and pass the rest down. And if they're little, I just put them on the floor. So then they just have to roll them down and play them. I don't care. And then I make sure the last kids who get the rhythm sticks have enough time to, you know, get the itch out. And then I go and they stop. Then if it's not a mistake and we can all tell when it's an actual mistake, yeah. um, if it's not a mistake, then it's 
the consequence that I might have to take it away if you're not following that direction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. after that. Yeah, absolutely. And now what about, go ahead, you were going to say something else. No, yeah. It, and, and even with older kids, uh, we pass out the two banos and tell them not to touch them. Very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I tell them, okay, I'm passing it out. You get it out now. Get it all out. Just mm -hmm. go all you want. And when I, when I play the cowbell, because you can't not hear a cowbell even over 30 Cibanos, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you need to stop and then you need, need to listen. I also give them strategies for when I want them to listen. I tell them, I'm the only one that's always in trouble at the Orpher shops for touching the instruments because I'm me. And so, and with little kids I go, and sometimes my hands just don't listen to me and they do things <laughs> that I don't want them to do. So I have to sit on them. So if your hands are like my hands and they don't listen, maybe you sit on your hands or you could cross your hands or you could put them on your head like this, Yeah. you know, or you could make a fist. Um, and hold them up here so that they listen to you. <laughs> and again, humor goes, goes, and, and then once you've done that with your little kids, then when they're fifth grade and you say that, they're like, oh, that's funny, Miss Bear. I remember that. Um, but they do it. I've yeah. seen fifth graders sitting on their hands <laughs> while I'm trying to give directions. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful because you're giving us, um, it's, it's not like, um, you're asking, uh, again, a kid to have more self-control than you do, right? Like how often am I like, I'm not going to look at my phone tonight after X time. And then it's just like, oh, my, sometimes my hands don't listen. I'm like, I'm, I'm scrolling Instagram. How did this happen? Right. But, but this idea of like, I physically put my hands on my head and it's an action that I can do instead of just like asking for willpower for an inaction, you know? And that's, mm -hmm. that's yes. Yes. Yeah. So strategy is to cope with the situation in a way. And then if you're handing little people or older people an instrument first and then giving directions you're setting yourself up for failure yeah. tell them everything you need to tell them about what you're going to be doing mm -hmm. in as little words as possible before you pa pass out the instruments then pass out the instruments and get right into the practice and the activity yeah yeah so things stay moving what about yeah. leslie ann what about um moving to barred instruments so um, I have, I was in two different buildings for primary and intermediate, and I had two different setups. So in, in my uh, intermediate, I was lucky enough to have stands, rolling stands. Yeah. If you can get rolling stands for your instruments, it is a game changer mm -hmm. because it's much easier to get them from point A to point B. Um, and I was super lucky. I had an old preschool room. So it was huge. Yeah. So I had like my seating area over here and I could actually set up a fair amount of instruments and have them in place already on the side. And then it was just, okay, walk to instruments. Um, when I could not, before I got my stands, I chose uh, students who I knew were super careful and were super helpful and who I could trust. And I made a big deal about saying all of those things. Um, and those were the kids who went and got the instruments off the shelf if we were only using a few. Mm -hmm. When we were doing whole class, I know I, I'm not a one kid, one instrument person. I tend to be a partner person um, because then one kid can help and one kid can play. And then if someone's missing it up, they can work together. There's always that one kid that can't handle a partner and loses their mind and, and they get to be by themselves. Um, but uh, so when they were all on the shelf, we would rehearse and practice over and over again. I would model, this is how I take it. This is how I put it away. This is where things go. Mm -hmm. And then they would choose their partner and sit on the floor where they were going to sit. Yeah. And then um, I would tell them which instrument they were getting. You're getting yeah. a soprano xylophone and the one partner would get the instrument and one partner would get the mallets. Yeah. Um, and that was before I got the, um, the sticky things to hold the mallets on the side of the instrument. Um, so, and then when we put it away, they switched jobs if, unless they didn't want to. So right. if, they, if they both wanted then one put away the instrument first and all the instruments got put away first before the mallets got put away. Yeah, so, so you don't have the people bonking into each other. Yeah. 
And I would say, okay, the bottom shelf is all of the alto xylophones. Mm -hmm. Alto xylophone one, alto xylophone two. And they knew that uh, they, when they put the instrument away, I gave them a pathway too. Yeah. So I had the shelves along the side and the chairs were here. So they picked it up, they put it down, and then they walked around the front of the chairs back to their seat. Mm -hmm. So then... I could call them one instrument at a time and I start with the instruments that are on the bottom shelf, go to the instruments that are on the second shelf. So then I know exactly if they're putting it in the wrong place mm -hmm. and the glockenspiels were on the top. So those were always last. And then I would do the same with the mallets, alto mallets. And I could call all of them at once to yeah. so go put them, those away. And the alto mallets had their own bucket. The soprano mallets had their own bucket. And everything was labeled. So they knew where things went. And then they could go back to their seat. And if it was like a lot of things, they would have a task when they got back to their seat. So pick up that folder again. And would you please uh, write a reflection about what we just did with this song or this piece? Mm -hmm. Write three sentences about what you did and what you liked or what you didn't like. Mm -hmm. So they had something to do in the in the time that we were going. And then we would discuss that for three or four minutes when we got back and then move on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're telling us, Leslie Ann, is regardless of if you are doing this on a cart um, in another teacher's classroom or if you are in a trailer with a very small space or if you are in the NPR with a very big, expansive space, it doesn't matter what the space is. The idea is that you have kind of backward designed like what what is every single tiny little thing that I want to see that will make the classroom move smoothly? And then you are setting up these procedures and you're taking the time to practice. It's not like go go um, get out the ORF instruments and then you're like, I can't believe that this was chaos, right? Like it, it feels chaotic if you just say, go get these instruments. And, and a lot yeah. of times, especially, and I, I'm sure that you can identify this as well because you teach upper grades as well and down to the littles, um, especially with these little people, the the shock in people's eyes when they realize you have to spell out every tiny thing that you want these kids to do. So taking the time to think through it on your own and not expecting kids to know what you're thinking, you have to like practice 30 million times and then always consistently, like you've already said, throughout the year. I think I think that's huge and it certainly applies to any situation. Kindergartners, I always set up myself. They're just not ready. <laughs> but my and my first graders and second graders, again, I choose four folks who are super careful and they do all the setup. So yeah. we, you know, in kindergarten, we identify soprano, alto, and I'll say, oh, I need two sopranos and I need four altos and I need the bases rolled over because the bases are on little wheel carts. Nice. Um, and those four students know where to put everything and then we take turns playing those instruments mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. from there so yeah that's great that's great okay super valuable so far let's wrap this up because you've talked through um like the start of the lesson like entrance procedures you've talked about helping us getting instruments to kids and from kids and away from kids and around kids and, and all of the prepositions um so now let's talk about another big area of chaos which is the, the class is, is done and maybe I've gone over like the meat of my lesson and I realize like maybe I don't really have enough time to get everybody lined up. And so then I say, go line up. And then three kids have fallen and one has pushed the other over and seven kids are cutting in line. And like, I'm the door holder, I'm the line leader and no, that's me, blah, blah, blah. And now, and now I'm frazzled. So Leslie Ann, help me. Um, so, <laughs> so this is, this is hilarious. So I live in Cleveland. Um, and nearby is Cedar Point, <laughs> the roller coaster capital of the world. So we do Cedar Point lineup. Cute. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we always end our, here's the other thing is I don't go over because I set an alarm on my phone yep. for five minutes before I want them to be in their chairs. Mm -hmm. And that's when we wrap up what we're doing, we put everything away, and then they unstack their chairs um, and get ready for the next class to come in. 
So my folder helper will put their folders away and then take the bit, put the bin for the next class that's coming in down if needed. Um, and then um, we are in our seats and we do our wrap up. Having a closing at the end is a game changer because it's not just, okay, we played the song, it was great, okay, let's put this away, let's go. And, then, and they're like on this like super high from just being super successful. And then we expect them as seven year olds to just, okay, I got it. Um, they're really excited about what they did if you're doing your job, right? Right. <laughs> so we go back to our seats and then we do some metacognating. What did we learn about? What did we do in music class today? Oh, and then, you know, they'll tell me all the things they did. What was your favorite part of the lesson today? What would you like to do with this next time? You know, just simple questions like that. And it it's amazing how uh, far that goes on your Danielson observation <laughs> at the end. So where do you think we're going to go with this song next time? Wow, you're like level seven Danielson now. Um, and it works. And I often get really good ideas to do with the lesson. I know you're like, oh, that's actually super smart. Okay. <laughs> so uh, then we're, you know, we're in our, our standing in. Okay, so the door is over here. But if I have them line up that way, I'm going to have a crash. So we line up the long way. Yep. So they stand, I'm like, okay, row one, please stand up, turn towards the windows. Row one, please walk towards the door. Okay, row two, your turn, please stand up, follow row one. Row three, stand up, turn towards the windows, walk towards the door, and enjoy the rest of your day at Cedar Point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a microphone. <laughs> and then there's a woman who she wasn't there this year. I was so disappointed. Maybe it just wasn't her shift, but she runs the the wind the wind seeker, which is this gigantic swings uh, that go like 50 million feet up in the air. And um, every time when you get off the ride, she goes, how was your ride? And I was like, yay! <laughs> and she's like, awesome, oh yeah. <laughs> like the most <laughs> low key, like awesome, oh yeah. And, uh, and so I always do that after the lineup. Awesome, oh yeah. And then um, to solve the lineup drama that row three is at the end, we switch rows every month. So mm -hmm. row one lines up first every month, row two lines up, and then row three lines up. Mm -hmm. And the class classes that do have line leaders, um, we practice again early because they'll be like, I'm not line. If you are a line leader, you wait until you line up and then you step out and go to the front if you are the caboose you line up and then you wait till everyone's lined up and then you go to the end yes so they should be seated in exactly the way they're sitting mm -hmm. and my seating charts are set up so shenanigans are not next to each other yes. so when they're in line there's not shenanigans mm -hmm. in the line mm -hmm. for my little people um, we sing a song and this was from a kindergarten teacher. I learned it in 1990, maybe. <laughs> really long time ago. She was not a music teacher. She was a kindergarten teacher. We do the same lineup pattern, but we do my eyes are looking forward. I'm standing straight and tall. My hands are on my shoulder and lip. I'm ready for the hall. I'll be walking, 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 looking straight ahead. Walking, 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 not a word is said. And we practice and we just keep singing it over and over again um, as until everyone lines up. <laughs> and I stand at the end of row one and they file around and then row two files around and row three files around. So they know when I move out of the way, it's time for that row to line up. That's beautiful, Leslie. And so you're using your physical presence there as well. Like you are a physical boundary for these kids because they're not going to wait until like the last seven year old is neatly standing in line. They're going to be like, they started. That means I can start. Right. So you're like, you're, you're helping them with every, every second, just to go back to something you said, I don't use um, a timer, but I do write down minute for minute where I need to be in my lesson. And I always hesitate to say that because it's like, Victoria, you are so like type a, like that sounds so <laughs> regimented, but if you don't have a very um, intense, time like a true cutoff time for an activity then it does it does meander right and then the teacher as comes an to orf person up. i'm okay with meandering 
but we need to stop on time. Yeah, because, which is like, we want it to blossom. Yeah. Because, I mean, I have, I have been lucky to have minutes in between class the past couple of years. There was a really long time in my career when I did not have minutes. And so um, when this class is lined up, the next class is already at the door. So I can let my lesson meander, but we're going to stop. If we have to be lined up at 10 o'clock, we're stopping at 9.55 no matter where we are. We're going to put a bookmark in that yes. and, <laughs> yeah. and know where we got to next time. And people are like, how do you keep track of that? I, I asked the kids, oh, wait, another Danielson moment. Well, <laughs> who can tell me where we ended up last class? <laughs> I mean, I know where we ended up, but I, I'm wondering if you know. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're now we're doing like review and and wow wow Danielson observation amazingness. Um right. Tom, I really can't remember. I just asked the kids. Yeah. Who can explain what we did last time and where did we lead off in this in this piece that we were working on? Yep. That'll tell you because they Absolutely. sure remember. Absolutely. There's always that one kid. <laughs> yep. Who can tell you exactly what you wore last time <laughs> and exactly the whole lesson from beginning to end. So use it. It works yep. out perfectly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I always put um, just like a squiggly line in my lesson plan and then I would write like three W. So like three W yeah. got to this place and then four, you know, like three, three, whatever got to this one. And so I have like all these squiggly lines so I know where we're going. But to your point, if we're doing like the blossom approach, it's like this, this class got to this point in the lesson, but then something else happened. We went a different direction. Right. And I don't really remember, but I remember it was a lot of fun. So that's when what you're saying, like you, you ask the kids, right? Like outsource. Yeah. And I, outsource. I do. If it's at all possible and I have it, you know, the minutes I keep track, of, I keep track of my Google slides or whatever right. slides I'm using yep. for the um, for the lesson, because I tend to put everything in one slide document. So I'm not switching between between things. The Definitely. YouTube video that we're using goes in there. The songs are linked in there if we have in a recorded accompaniment. Um, and we just go from slide to slide to slide. So if I didn't get to that song that we were going to, that we did get to with the other mm -hmm. class, I just write, didn't sing it. Yeah. Five, one, didn't sing it. Yeah. So that I know next time. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Leslie Ann, you've given us so much um, very concrete stuff, but it's also been conceptual enough that we can apply it in 30 million different teaching scenarios. So as we are wrapping up, what, um, what words of, uh, wisdom or or kind of just anything else that you think we should have in the back of our minds. You and I are having this conversation before before we start the year. So so when this comes out closer to the start of the school year, what are some things that we can just be kind of thinking about like, oh, Leslie Ann told me to do whatever, whatever, whatever. So the thing that helps me the most when I am thinking through these procedures is before I set up anything in my room, I stand at the front of the room and I visualize the students walking through the situation. Yeah. So yes, it might be the most aesthetically pleasing to put the pencils and the paper there. However, they're going to have to trip over this and this is in the way and it might be less aesthetically pleasing to put it over there but it's the more efficient place for it to be. And then think about the things that drive you nuts. For me personally, the pencil sharpener drives me nuts. Like the sound of it makes, so I, that's why I started the pencil system. Mm -hmm. So no one has to sharpen their pencil in the middle of class because there's always 60 ready to go because that sound makes me insane. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, when you're thinking about where where your chairs go and or where your spots are going to be think about how am i going to get to the stuff on that shelf how are my kids going to get to these supplies and that supplies and whatever you're going to need how are they going to get books if you use books mm -hmm. um so if they know if you're visualizing all of those things before you put things down. That really helps um, me to figure out where everything should go so that it's most efficient. 
And then, uh, oh, people always say, how do you get them to not use the pencil sharpener? It's stuck to the wall. I put a plastic bag over it and I taped it and I said it was broken. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and then I, you know, I got the electric pencil sharpener, um, you know, that we all have. And uh, that's kept in a, a side. And the only people who are allowed to use it is me and the um, that one person and, and the, the students who are my helpers. And I pay them and Jolly Ranchers or whatever they want. And then. Um, one more thing with that is when they get stubby, they go into a plastic bag. And then when I know I'm going to have a sub, the plastic bag full of stubby pencils comes out and they all disappear and that's okay. <laughs> and then all my good pencils don't disappear when there's a sub because I just leave, I put those away and take out the stubby bag of <laughs> pencils. So, smart. Yeah. Um, so if those disappear, they're this long, I don't care. Uh -huh. <laughs> I make uh -huh. sure they're sharpened and they're in the back. <laughs> so smart. So you've told us, think about the things that drive you nuts. So there's some self-awareness that happens here. Like me as the teacher who spends, you know, seven, eight, nine hours a day in this room. Um, what will help me love my job at the end of the day? And, and then, your kids. And my kids. <laughs> to love <Yes>. your kids. <laughs> Yeah. So, and, and like you said earlier, like there are certain triggers for each of us and what bothers you, like you have a higher noise tolerance for me. And that's what you said at the very beginning, right? Like this is not Leslie Ann does this. So now everyone does this. This is Leslie Ann is thinking through these processes for the processes, right? <laughs> um, that's metacognition for us as well. So thinking through our process for the process before kids ever walk in the room and just to kind of yes and something you're saying is uh, if we are on a cart, then that would mean walking into the, the first grade classroom one, first grade classroom two, three, four, and saying like, I've, this is a I've different I've done procedure. that as well. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah, it's the same thing. I had to kind of map out where was I gonna put my cart um, and I'll go and talk to the teachers and, and look at how their setup is and you know, some are much more cooperative than others, but, um, and then with the cart thing, um, I always point out to teachers who may not be as welcoming that you didn't buy that smart board. Ooh. That belongs to the district and I am a district employee. I can plug my computer into your smart board. So unless you, unless the teacher has purchased it on their own, now I don't say it like that. <laughs> No, but that's the um, presence. Yeah. That's the presence. Um, yeah. the, uh, I know you can't plug into my smart board. I, I don't think that smart board belongs to you. I think it's for all of us to use to um, serve the children in the best way that we can. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that does belong, the teacher actually purchased on their own, I don't touch it unless yeah. they tell me I can. Yeah. But um, otherwise, um, you know, if it's school property, it's for all of us to use. And then in that case, my helpers are my move stuff for me from move it back to my cart and then move things. If I need to move things from room to room, um, I have those little helpers that move things from room to room for me. When I was on a cart in three buildings. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, so procedures are, are even more important in, in that situation. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. All right, Leslie Ann, um, I'm so grateful for your time. I'm so grateful for all of the work that you do in this space for uh, music teachers everywhere. And I think everyone listening, um, I know I'm walking away like this year. I was like, oh, I've got it. I should try that. I should try that. I should try that. So I, my wheels are spinning. I know everyone like washing dishes or driving in their car or whatever, setting up their classroom. And they're like, yeah. oh yeah, this is excellent. So so I'm yeah. super grateful for, for everything that you share. Um, wrapping up, Leslie Ann, where can we find you and hang out with you? And if we want to learn from you more, where can we do that? Um, so I, ha I do have a website. It's uh, www.3littlebirds, uh, like Bob Marley, dot Cute. com. And then um, you can find me on TikTok um, and on Facebook and on Instagram as well. And uh, if you need someone to help you to visualize those things, that is one of the services that I offer through my business. You can webcam me into your building, or if you're in the Cleveland area, I can come to your school and help you um, figure that out. I did that for a colleague of mine. Um, he was teaching K through eight uh, music and band. So the room was just like everything. And uh, we actually got it down to 
a way that he could manage the classroom and it didn't look so overwhelmingly cluttered for him. So yeah, I can do that for you as well. Excellent. Fabulous. All right, Leslie Ann, thank you so much for your time. I'm looking forward to, um, I'll, I'll uh, send you an email, let me know, and I'll let you know how all of these procedures go for me as well. All of the new Excellent. stuff that I'm going to I would love to hear from everyone who, uh, who got a new idea and how it worked. Mm -hmm.